welcome to Leatherwood. Here's what you need to know. If you're a first time guest or a recent guest, we hope you felt welcome as you entered in today. Guests, we have one request of you and that is as you leave today, if you wouldn't mind going to our Welcome Center, filling out a guest card and exchanging that for a gift from us. Here at Leatherwood, we believe that small groups are the strength of our church and all of our small groups are currently meeting. So if you're not sure which class would be great for you and your family, you can go out to our lobby. There's a board out there with our offerings or go on our website, pick a class, make a plan and join us for our next scheduled gathering. Here at Leatherwood, we have a new member slash prospective members class called Discover Leatherwood that meets with a pastor and other staff for one session. We provide lunch, answer any questions that you have about our church, and give you some great resources. So if you've been coming here for a little while, or you're new here and you're not sure what your next step is, it's probably this class. How do you get in it? You just see me or one of the other staff members and say, I want to be in that next set of Discover classes, and we'll make sure that that happens. Here at Leatherwood, we have many easy ways to give, so please pick the way that's best for you. You can give online at our website, easytide.com backslash LBCAL. You can give in the plates as you leave today. You can mail it in or drop it by the church. And once again, church, thank you for a fantastic year in your generosity. Today, after service, we're going to be celebrating our senior adults with a cookout. And there's several times for you to go after each service, so it's out on the north side of our campus. Make sure you stop and get your family a hamburger and a hot dog as we celebrate together. Once again, guests, we just want to say thank you so much for you being here today. We know that you have options and we don't take it lightly that you've chosen to worship with us. Please don't forget to fill out that guest card. Also, we'd like to take a moment to invite you to our Wednesday night midweek family night. We have something for all ages, nursery all the way up, and you'll be so glad that you came. But once again, thank you for being here. God bless you, and we cannot wait to see you next week. See you here, Leather. We'll, we'll stand and worship with us this morning. I was very Thank you. 
Amen. Continue to worship with us this morning. Let the redeemed.
chapter 5 as we continue our first and last series. Jesus is the first and last, the beginning and the end. We're thankful very much for a church body that is diverse in age. One of our goals from the very beginning, and you've been able to pull it off, 
is to have people of all different kind of ages. And one of those ages are our senior adults. We're so thankful to have mature, uh, serving, giving, encouraging senior adults. We want to make sure after the service you go by and uh, or after Sunday school, whichever one for you, I think there's three stages of folks going by and, and get, getting a plate. Our deacons are out there uh, grilling those right now. Hamburgers and hot dogs guests especially want you to go by. Just right out here you'll see them. Please go by and either stay under the tent and eat with us or grab you a plate and go. We just want to celebrate that we are a blessed church uh, this morning. Strong believers operate in a lot of confidence in God. We call it faith, but it's really deeper than that. It's, it's really deeper than believing God. It's actually operating in that belief, that confidence. Strong churches operate with strong confidence in God, that he is everything he said he was, that he does everything that he said he will do, and that when it's all said and done, we're going to be with him in his heaven because of his son. It's that simple. Strong churches operate in that. They don't go away from that. They preach the gospel to the very end. And we understand that there is an occurrence that is quickly coming. And the reason I believe that uh, people like me uh, honestly feel like it's, it's very quickly coming because we're becoming more and more uh, worldwide dependent on people. Sometimes we'll call it government, but it's our dependence on government or people to get us through situations and we're uh, further and further getting away from our dependence on God. Have you noticed that? Well, there's a reason for that. It's the only way that the tribulation period can work. If the population will constantly move away from God and toward dependence on government or people, then that's how the tribulation is going to work so well for those who are left behind on this earth. Now what we understand about chapter 5 is really an extension of chapter 4. If there weren't numbers, you would see this as one piece of the letter. It is to prepare us for chapters 6 through 18 of what's going to happen on the earth after the church is taken to be to the presence of God because of Christ and the rapture. So please see it that way, that this is chapter 5, is a, a place of preparation for what's going to happen on the earth after the church is taken into glory to be with the Lord. If you will stand as we honor the reading of the Word of God. Worthy is the Lamb. I'm going to read the first seven verses, chapter 5 of the Revelation. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, a book, written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able or they did not have the legal right. It wasn't that they weren't physically able. They, no one had the legal right to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much. Why is he weeping? Look back at chapter 4, verse 1. Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. John wants to know what's going to take place after the rapture. I wept much. No one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah... The root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Lord, help us to understand. As believers, Lord, we have total confidence in what you have said and what you have done and what you plan, what you plan for us, the church, and what you plan for those who have rejected your death, burial, and resurrection. We as a church go forward in confidence that you are in control, not only now, 
but forever. Help us to operate in that confidence. Help us to see people come to you by faith just like we did. And help us to understand, Lord, we can't spend our time worrying. We've got a lot of work to do. And we've got a lot of worship to do. Help us be found worshiping and serving when you come. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, one of the best ways to understand this, what's going on, is to study uh, the book of Jeremiah, especially in chapter 32 of Jeremiah. Let me read you just a piece of this. Now, Jeremiah is in prison when this happened, what I'm reading to you. He's in prison just because of preaching, preaching the truth. He's in prison, but God moved on him to redeem some property that his cousin had lost. Listen to some of these words. Now, remember, he's in prison. They have to bring the paperwork to him in prison for him to sign. So I bought the field from Hamiel, the son of my uncle, who was in Anathoth, and weighed out to him the money, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, took witnesses, weighed the money on the scales. I took the purchase deed, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open. I gave the purchase deed to Baruch, the son of Neri, son of Masilah, in the presence of Hamel, my uncle's son, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the purchase deed before all the Jews who sat in the court of the prison. Then I charged Baruch before them, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this purchase deed which is sealed and this deed which is open, put them in my earthen or an earthen vessel, that they may last many days. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in the land. Now, Jeremiah was the kinsman redeemer. He was the legal heir to some property that was lost by somebody he's relative to. He's the one that was in line that could correct this problem. But there's still two problems. One of them is... He's in jail. How, are you gonna, how would you like to be in jail and you, you inherit some property? You can't enjoy your property. It says you, it's yours. Down at the courthouse, it's in your name, but you're in jail. You're in prison. You can't go and walk over it. You can't, uh, you can't cause it to be better. You can't you know, work on the driveway. You can't put a water meter in. You're in jail and there's nothing you can do. Second problem about his property that he has gained. The Babylonians are in charge. They have taken Israel captive, Judah captive. And so, yes, he's got property. He legally obtained it. He can't enjoy it because he's in the wrong place. And the wrong people are in charge. Do you understand what this is about now? When John is looking at a sealed document, and in this document, if you will, is the title deed to mankind, and to all the earth. When Jesus went to the cross, he bought back everything Adam lost. It belongs to him. But I've got to tell you, and guess what? All of us who have trusted Christ, we are now free indeed in Christ. But let's be honest, we're still held, held captive. We're in a body that is aging, that actually dies, that gets sick, we're in a world that is anti against Christ. If you will, we're still in prison. And the wrong people are in charge. Well, there's one of these days that's going to get fixed. You see, Jesus has already bought it back by his death, burial, and resurrection. But there's some things that's got to happen. What had to happen in Judah before, before that land could be used? Judgment against God's people and against the enemy. That's what we need to understand. What's it going to take to make things right with God like they were in the beginning that Adam gave up? It's going to take judgment against God's people and against the enemy to reconcile everything back to God. The question I have today, the most important question, is when Jesus does step out on that cloud, as Paul describes, and Jesus does make that shout, and that trumpet does sound. Will you leave this earth and go to be with Christ forever? 
Because the best I can understand, this picture that John is writing about, the church has already been raptured, and we're being informed of what's about to start happening on the earth as God begins that cycle of bringing the earth back to Him by judgment. Will you be taken in the rapture, or will you be left behind? It's the most important decision you will make today. Please decide Christ today and don't leave and try to deal with it on your own Jesus desires for the church to know that he's in charge now and forever that's why he's able to see these things all these things have to happen according to Jesus when you ask why is there a tribulation period coming because the the because of what has happened when Adam lost everything that was given to him Jesus has paid, but now everything has to be made right. Let's talk about a couple of things that are wrong before we talk about how God is going to make them right. Adrian Rogers once said this, The question is not who is willing to be in charge of the future. We can see all around us there's tons of people who are willing to take over and take charge of the world and our lives. But the question is who is worthy, not who is willing who is worthy? Worthy is the Lamb. What has to be fixed? First of all, mankind is fallen. Mankind is fallen. Verse 3, he said, all over heaven we look to try to find... You know, man, you're talking about, you're talking about Peter would have been up there. I mean, you're talking, about, you're talking about, you know, everybody that's ever been good, even those that trusted Christ, are standing there in that crowd. But nobody's able to do it. Nobody is worthy to open this, this title deed. This thing was sealed seven times, which probably means that it was written on the front and when they ran out of room on the back, but they would roll it up and they would seal it as they went along. In other words, there's probably one seal on the outside and then there's six more on the inside. So as that thing is open, something is going to happen on the earth. We'll get into that in the next few weeks. And then another seal is broken and more is going to happen on the earth. It's written also on the outside. See, some knowledge, you can go down to the courthouse. It's, it's public knowledge. You can look up people's stuff with their property. You can find it. It's for public knowledge. But some things on the inside, it's not for public knowledge. It's for only those of us who are redeemed who can get. That's why we're blessed to study this book so we can get an insight on what's really going to go on on the earth written on both sides as, they, as he begins to open it. I've always been interested in, in freight businesses. My dad owned one, and I, as a kid, came up in that. And one thing that I noticed, a lot of the major freight lines were started during the Great Depression. I have books, and I'm, I'm a collector of old metal uh, freight trucks and hats and stuff at, in my man cave, and I keep these books that tell the history of freight businesses. And what I noticed is so many came out during the Depression and started and the first generation of owner did well, but then when he died or passed it down to the second generation, almost all of them are bankrupt today. In other words, now I don't know if you can place the blame on the second generation or on the situation in our economy or what, but the, 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 the ones that began it pass it down to the younger ones and many times they lose the business. They simply can't do what the first generation was able to do. God handed the whole world to Adam, basically. I mean, you just handle things. You just keep the garden dressed. You reach out and get fruit. And, and you, uh, you know, they were going to uh, just have family and everything was going to be great. No, couldn't handle it. Couldn't handle it. For, you know, when he gets tempted, he and his wife, they fall and they lose. Now they are called sinners, lawbreakers, transgressors, separated from God, we're even called dead in the Scripture, all because of what Adam and Eve did there in the garden. Let me read to you Genesis 3 and verse 17. Listen to this. This is the description. That so God said to Adam, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Listen, look at this. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns, thistles, it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. 
Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. All that came with the fall. Mankind is fallen. You're a sinner. You're a lawbreaker. You've transgressed. You're separated from me because of my holiness and your sinfulness. You're dead to me spiritually. You will one day die physically. Before Adam could age and die, his son killed his other son. That's what comes with the fall. Death, the first funerals were done. Death has reigned ever since. No one in heaven, on the earth, or under the earth was worthy to break the seals and to allow the tribulation to begin. Mankind is fallen and the earth is cursed. By the way, Israel is still not saved. I looked it up this week. Per capita, there's more atheists in Israel than there are in the United States. Jeremiah said this, 820. He said this to the Jew. Harvest is past, summer is ended, and we are still not saved. Israel has still not come to God. They've gotten further and further away from God. Uh, the, the Western countries are getting further and further away from God. The, mankind has fallen, the earth is cursed. Uh, tornadoes in Wellington. I remember when I first moved out there, a guy I met, he said, uh, you know, a, a bad tornado hit Wellington in 1954. I said, man, I wasn't even alive, couldn't care less. You know what I'm saying? I was walking one day up on this mountain up close to our house. I was a teenager just walking around, uh, trespassing, by the way. Anyway, and I look on top of this mountain, and there, you know, back in the day, barn tin was real metal. It was real stuff, right? I looked up in this tree, a big oak tree, and there was barn tin that looked like you had wrapped it, and it was just a wad in a tree, and it dawned on me, that's from 1954, that tornado my friend told me about. Well, now we're used to tornadoes in Wellington. We got, Robert and I, we got helmets and boots ready, available in any, any moment, flashlight and all that. We got all that. We're, it, it's a real deal. Why is there tornadoes, hurricanes, all stuff? Because the earth is cursed. The earth is cursed. It's going to be this way, uh, you know, from now on. Because of Adam and Eve, you got humans created to worship God and loving life they are now kicked out. They're kicked out. They're aging. They're dying. If you'll study this, you've got a snake that used to have arms and legs and lost his arms and legs in the fall. He's slithering around on the ground. You've got vegetation that was created to be good, but now all of a sudden it has to compete with weeds and briars and thistles that take away moisture and take away the sunlight. What I'm saying to you is everything that was created was created to be good. And it is no longer fulfilling what it was created to do. Everything is, is off kilter. Everything is wrong in the universe and we try and try and try to make it right. Robin told me when they were coming up, it reminded me of the day my brother-in-law, one of my brother-in-laws brought dad-in-law over to see us. He's in his 80s and and uh, one of the brother-in-laws brought him by, and it reminded me, Robin said when they were young, her two older brothers, they're only about a year or so apart, they, would, they lived in gas in the Payton community, and they'd go down the street there to play, next thing you know, Big Ted was getting a call. Sam and Eric's in a fight again, not a fight against somebody else, each other. Well, they're fighting, so Big Ted would just walk down the street, he'd go get them, bring them home, put them in the yard, said, now, he'd sit down there, with a glass of tea on the steps. Now fight. And so Ted and Eric would tie up again. I mean, Eric and Sam would tie up again. And listen, that was, I don't know if that worked or not. They seemed to be pretty good guys. Now they, they lived through it and everything seems fine. But why do we fight? Why do we have wars? Why do we go to court? Why do people hurt each other, kill each other? Because mankind has fallen and the earth is cursed. Listen to this, Romans 8, chapter 20. Listen to this. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans 
and labors with birth pains together until now. What's in that deed that John sees? Everything that's got to happen for this thing to ever be right again. And he knows it. He knows it. The buzzword right now in our world is the word justice. Justice. You have, I looked it up the other day, just want to see how many justices I was supposed to, to show justice in. It's about 15. I'll pin down two or three. One of them is social justice. There's climate justice. Climate justice. Somebody asked me, do you believe in climate change? Of course, you live in Alabama. Yesterday morning, it was thermals in the morning, spandex in the evening, was it not? <laughs> of course, I believe in it. It's been changing ever since the fall. And you ain't seen the last yet. Wait till you get into tribulation and you'll see some climate change. It's going to be common in those seven years. Of course, it changes. Uh, you also have animal justice. You can't even eat a can of Vienna sausage without offending somebody nowadays. You know what I mean? But here's the problem. Our number is six. You got it? The reason our number is six, we were created on six day. Jesus died for our sins on the sixth day of the week. Our number is six. God's is seven. So six means we're not complete. We're incomplete. We're imperfect. A bunch of sixes asking a bunch of other sixes to make the world a perfect place ain't going to happen. It's impossible. But there's a seven on the way that's going to fix everything. I promise you that. We need to understand that. We are moving toward the tribulation period because we're crying out justice, justice, and we're asking sixes to do it. That's why 666 is the number of man during the tribulation because it's man's his ultimate attempt to be God and it's going to ultimately fail. Corey Ten Boom said this, If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look inward, you'll be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you can have rest. Look at Christ and know this. So John has got his focus on the deed, the document. And listen, many people are right now are focused on the problems in our world and they're missing Christ totally. Others are focusing on prophecy. A lot of people focus on prophecy and they miss Christ. John is sitting right there and he's looking at the document, the deed. All along, all along, the Lamb of God was sitting right there. It took him a few minutes to gather himself and to take his eyes off the document and to put it where it belonged, right on Christ. And I'll say to the church, take your eyes off the problem. Do your best to be salt and light in a problematic world. Let's make it better. But if you think you can fix it all, you're going to be one more out person trying to fix every ill of society. Worry turns to worship right in the presence of Jesus. Look in verse 5. The elder says, look, stop crying. When I looked up, when it, the word weep right here, this meant uncontrollable sobbing John had. Elder says, calm down, John. Look, there is someone worthy that's going to open the seals on this deed, this document. And he said, there's a lion of the tribe of Judah. He's worthy. He's on the throne. As I turned to look, I didn't see a lion. I saw a lamb. Well, Brother Mike, who, what's the, the lion represent? Listen, Israel needs to profess Christ as Messiah. That's the Messiah they need, the lion of the tribe of, of Judah in the line of David. They need to profess him. Peter professed him as Messiah. Andrew professed him as Messiah. You are the Lord. Paul professed him as Messiah. He was, Judah. he was Jewish. The Jews must profess him as Lord. But they needed the Lamb of God just like everybody else. They did not understand that he had come to die for their sins. He came to remove their sins as far as east is from the west. He knows what it takes to get mankind and creation back to its original purpose, and it's going to happen. You see, all that Adam lost in the fall, Jesus will redeem. 
If you look in the back of the book, and I do this a lot, as I'm studying Revelation, I go back and I get in the back of the book and remind myself how good it's going to be. You see, Revelation chapter 20, verse 14 says this, Death and hell are going to be cast into the lake of fire. My first funeral, I hadn't been pastor here for two weeks. It was a baby. It was my nephew. He died on the day before his due date. I'm, I'm talking about my first funeral. I have buried gunshot victims. I've buried uh, people that took their own lives. People that in wrecks. I buried, listen, recently buried a, a, a saint. Uh, a friend of mine, a lady in the church. I've been knowing her for 40 years. It, death hurts, y'all. I built, you buried young people, old people, everybody in the middle. Death hurts one day. It will be thrown where it belongs. Amen. And we're never going to talk about it anymore in the presence of the Lord when it's all fixed. Revelation 21 and 1 says this. A new heaven and a new earth is going to come because the first heaven and earth have passed away. Why are they passed away? Because Christ is going to judge them. They are cursed as well. And then the worship begins as we prepare for a time of response. Listen, you're here today and you need to receive Christ. I want you to know He's done everything that it takes to make you right with God. He died for your sins. They buried Him, but He rose the third day. Worship begins. Verse 9. They sang a new song saying. You are worthy to take the scroll. To open its seals. For you were slain. You have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of the tribe and tongue and people and nation. And have made us kings and priests to our God. You see I get to preach the good news. About Jesus Christ, you get to preach the good news. We shall reign on the earth. I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders. The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Every creature which is in heaven on the earth and on the earth, such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor, glory and power be to him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Now here's the thing to the church today. Listen. All this group in heaven, I believe it represents the church, all the created beings, all the angels. They're all tuned in about what's about to happen. They find out that Jesus is in charge. He takes the throne. He takes the throne from his father, if you will. His father is sinner, father God. But when Jesus takes that scroll, you can see that's a transfer of all authority in heaven and earth. Jesus is now central of the throne. Here's the thing the church needs to understand. All these beings, human and angelic, up here in the presence of Christ, when he takes that deed, they didn't wait until that deed was unsealed and all that stuff began to happen on the earth to begin to worship. They went ahead and started worship. Why? Because they trusted what they had heard and they trusted what they saw. You and I can't wait till after we're raptured and after the earth goes through tribulation and a thousand years of millennial reign with Christ on the earth to start worshiping and witnessing. It is time for the church now, now to reach as many as we can before it's everlasting too late in every way we're wired to do that. Would you pray with me right now? Listen, you're here today and you've never received Christ. I would beg you if it did any good, but it's not about me. I want you to understand that in just less than a second, the church is going to be raptured. And what we read 
today is going to begin to unfold in heaven. And down on the earth, the things as we begin to study are going to unfold. The goal is redemption. But some people won't believe like a child today. They refuse to. I don't know why, but if Christ is pulling you to him today, use the childlike faith that God would be glad to give you this morning if you'll just humble yourself and receive the gospel. Because on the earth, when the church is gone, the only way to redeem the earth is going to be through judgment. It's going to be almost hell on earth. Don't wait till it's too late. You've heard the gospel today, and for you, it will be too late. Move now if the Holy Spirit's dealing with you now. If you're a believer, what are you doing to reach people? Let's get busy in the way God's wired you. We all are kings and priests now. We have authority to give the good news. Lord, save someone today. Strengthen the church. We love you right back in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand. Doors of church are open and God's leading you to Leatherwood. Come, let us get you started on your journey. We need you to serve the Lord in however way you're wired to do so. You come. Come this morning. Any way we can help you, please come. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and find in me thine all. Jesus made it all, yes. all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as Yeah.